From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power with Anne-Marie Hordern in New York. I'm Joe Matthew. The Biden administration taking fresh steps to stabilize the financial sector in the wake of SVB's collapse, pressing regulators to tighten the rules for mid-sized banks. The president is committed uh, to make sure that we keep our banks resilient, and that's what you're seeing today. And the president of Taiwan president making of Taiwan. a stop in New York City. She says Taiwan is at the front lines of democracy. China's not happy about the visit, but the U.S. is telling Beijing not to overreact. It's time Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrapping up comments here in Washington, D.C. and making news saying the latest bank failures show deregulation might have gone too far. We'll have more on all these stories coming up. Plus, we'll sit down with CFTC head Rostin Benham to talk financial regulation and the lawsuit against crypto firm Binance. And top political voices from around the world will be joining us here on Balance of Power. Venezuelan opposition leader Leo, Leopoldo Lopez will be with us on set. Plus, we'll talk with Bermuda Premier David Burt all in this hour. But first, we begin with our political panel in Washington, D.C. Joining us today are Bloomberg's Kate Davidson and Ian Marlowe. As Joe just mentioned, we have Secretary Janet Yellen talking about deregulation, potentially having a little bit of cause of what's been going on in the banking sector and now the Biden administration coming out. And Biden wants tougher regulation. But, Kate, he says that this doesn't have to go through Congress. Explain. Well, that's right, Anne-Marie. Um, I mean, we heard this uh, something similar from Fed Vice Chair Michael Barr this week, right, that there are steps that they can take through regulation um, in the way that they supervise these mid-sized banks, which is really the group that they're looking at, uh, where they just have to change the rules, um, the federal rules within the Federal Reserve. Um, and, right, that doesn't require congressional approval, and, and the White House is happy to recommend a number of potential changes, basically to make regulation look more, uh, more similar to how the biggest banks in the country are regulated, essentially um, kind of reversing some of the regulatory rollback that happened um, in a few years ago. Kate, the administration can call for whatever it wants. Do regulators need to listen? Well, it's interesting. I mean, a White House official told reporters on a call today that they had reached out to the um, agencies, that they'd spoken with the Fed. Of course, you're right. They don't have to. But mm -hmm. I think that the Fed, uh, you know, it, basically Michael Barr, when he was testifying for, for Congress this week, yeah. kind of strongly signaled that this is something that they could take a look at. I mean, the Fed is getting a ton of blowback over what happened with these mid-sized banks. Why did supervisors not catch some of the problems earlier? And it's, it's not totally clear yet that um, some of these steps would have avoided what we're seeing. Um, um, but it's an obvious, an obvious area where they can make some fixes and improve um, and make sure that they're more closely scrutinizing mid-sized banks. Kate, what does this mean for the likes of Senator Elizabeth Warren? With the White House coming out saying that they want to look into, uh, they're calling for more of this regulation, does that quell the nerves of these senators who are saying we need to pass congressional legislation on regulation? Well, it may. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think it will be uh, pretty difficult to get something um, that, that goes further than this through Congress. I mean, you know, a lot of people have pointed to some of the regulatory rollback as a Trump, uh, Trump rollback. But there were, I, think, I believe it was 16, uh, certainly a, a large group of Democratic lawmakers who also supported this effort. And some of them are still in Congress. So um, I, I think it's not at all clear that there's widespread support for making broader changes. But as I said, there are are plenty of significant changes, I think certainly from the perspective of these banks, uh, significant changes that they can make that would have an immediate effect on, um, you know, the, the, how much liquidity the banks hold, how often they're subject to stress tests, um, uh, whether they have to prepare detailed plans for what they would do in the event of a failure. And that's all, that, that is significant. So the Treasury Secretary making some news today saying that deregulation may have gone too far. We've spent the last two weeks talking about 2018, like it's some sort of time machine. Uh, 2155 has become a household name. But didn't Michael Barr say in questions and answers during that testimony that the changes made to Dodd-Frank were likely not responsible for the SVB failure, that the Fed did have the authority to act, and it didn't? 
Well, I think he did. Uh, you know, he, he definitely he definitely did acknowledge that the Fed had the discretion here, and that was something that lawmakers at the time, uh, certain lawmakers that supported the measure, they wanted to include that. And mm -hmm. uh, even Jay Powell at the time was quoted as saying, uh, I think when he was testifying in Congress, they asked him, would, would you have discretion here? Yeah. He said at the time, yes. So it was kind of hard for him to avoid that, to Doesn't not exactly acknowledge it. I, th I think that that's fair, but I also think that Michael Barr this week was very careful to say, look, we're doing a review. We don't exactly know what uh, the causes, you know, the many causes of this were. So we can make a det determination on that um, after we've done all this work, and we'll let you know by May 1st. We also have here in New York City Taiwan's president, and this is getting a lot of attention, of course, what, how China is going to react. And we have a spokesperson for China's Taiwan Affairs Office warning Tsai Ing-wen, the Taiwanese president, not to meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, which is expected next week. Take a listen. Should the leader of Taiwan engage with the Congress Speaker McCarthy during her transit in the U.S., it will be another provocation that seriously violates the One China principle, damages China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and undermines peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. We firmly oppose this and will take resolute countermeasures to fight back. And the White House has been trying to play this down. They're saying that this has happened before. She's transiting through America. But if she meets with Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, it's going to be a difficult one for them to explain to Beijing, isn't it? Yeah, it's an unusual transit. I think most people's uh, international stopovers don't involve, uh, you know, two trips, uh, several meetings, speeches, you know, formal dinners and things like that. So you can see to some extent why Beijing is angry about this. But the administration, the State Department, the White House, everyone is trying to make the point over and over again, that, uh, telling Beijing not to overreact telling them that this stuff has happened before. Tsai herself has actually transited through the U.S. in this manner uh, before. The big thing here, obviously, is, is Speaker McCarthy, whether she meets with him on the way back, which she's likely to do. I mean, obviously, uh, Nancy Pelosi, the, the former House Speaker, went to Taiwan, and that caused uh, U.S.-China ties to spiral out of control. There were military exercises in response. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anyone expects that kind of reaction, just given that meeting a House speaker uh, of a different party on U.S. soil is different than flying into Taiwan. Uh, it's not as provocative, but it is still provocative to of course, some degree. Kevin McCarthy says he's going to do the same thing, right? He, he actually promised a bipartisan Codell to Taiwan. I spoke with Congressman John Garamendi today from California. He was on a Codell to Taiwan a couple of months back, right after Nancy Pelosi, and said he'd love to join Kevin McCarthy, even while they agree on nothing. I just wonder, though, as the administration twists itself into a pretzel here to not use the word visit, it's transit, not visit, why do the semantics matter there? Why not say, you know what, she can come here anytime she wants? Yeah, I mean, the semantics are really important in a, in a, when the policy itself is strategic ambiguity. It's yes. right. Will we defend Taiwan if, if China invades? Won't we? It, there's, <laughs> words matter, and you can see the way the, the U.S. officials are kind of like reading out really long statements. We abide by the six assurances, yeah. the, you know, the three communiques. It, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very rote. It's very performative, and it's meant to reassure China that they're not trying to change the status quo, that everything is the same, that these things, even though they've happened in the past, everyone kind of goes through the, the same song and dance. China, you know, condemns it. The U.S. says you shouldn't overreact. Mm. And everyone tries to sort of move on. But I think at the same time, uh, we've, we've, we do really have a, a serious problem in U.S.-China relations. And the, the bipartisan nature, as you say, of these Republican lawmakers wanting to go to Taiwan, wanting to push China's buttons on this, it, it benefits them politically to do that. Mm -hmm. And it really hurts the administration's attempt to, uh, you know, their previous attempts to try and stabilize ties. And at the moment, there's no... There's no uh, momentum on either side, on the Chinese side or the U.S. side, to, to find a sort of soft landing for this dispute. Ian, of course, we're going to expect a lot of war words, I think, next week when it comes to Washington and Beijing, if this meeting does happen. But I just, before you leave, I want to get your insight into what's going on in Russia. We have this 31-year-old Wall Street Journal reporter detained by the FSB. Here's what the White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, had to say about it. This espionage charges are ridiculous. The targeting of American citizens by Russian government is unacceptable. We condemn the detention of Mr. Gerskovich in the strongest, in the strongest terms. We also condemn the Russian government's continued targeting and repression of journalists. 
Ian, mm -hmm. does Evan Gershkovich now just become the latest individual person that has to be in the crosshairs of Moscow, Washington, and they're just very much so depleted, terrible relationship at this moment? Yeah, I was talking to someone today who referred to this as a dark turn, and I think um, they also pointed out that this is coming after a bunch of Russian intelligence agents were rounded up across Europe. There's been, uh, you know, the Brazilian grad student, uh, you know, who was who was in the U.S. Um, there's uh, not much. They uh, some people feel that Russia has to trade back, and so right now you're seeing Russia engage in what very much looks like. The same kind of hostage diplomacy uh, that that ensnared Brittany Griner, uh, you know, and others. So I think people are expecting this to be a little bit protracted. The details here, in terms of uh, the way the, uh, the Russian intelligence has treated the case, the way he hasn't been allowed uh, access to his lawyer in court, there's a lot of details that are very, very concerning to U.S. officials here. So I think uh, everyone's treating this very seriously. They're being relatively cautious. Russia has not responded yet. So I think there's still a little bit of uh, hesitation at the moment to, for U.S. officials to be so, uh, you know, to condemn Russia overly harshly at the moment because they really do, they, they don't really know what's going to come out of this in terms of Russia. Ian and Kate, thank you for helping us walk through our top stories here. Bloomberg's Kate Davidson and Ian Marlowe. Coming up, we're talking financial regulation in the crypto space specifically on the heels of CFTC's lawsuit against Binance. The last shoe has finally dropped. This was really what I think the whole industry was waiting, waiting to see. We'll speak with CFTC Chairman Rostin Benham next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is the largest global exchange that exists in this ecosystem. And so I think we're going to have to see how all this plays out. A lot will depend on what, what Binance chooses to do. That was Sheila Warren, CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation, speaking on Tuesday regarding the suit filed against cryptocurrency exchange Binance by the CFTC. Here to discuss is CFTC Chairman Ross Benham. Mr. Chairman, Thanks so much for joining us today in studio. Uh, the reaction from Binance to the lawsuit here, they call it an incomplete recitation of facts. Where are they wrong? Well, you know, first of all, thanks for having me. It's sure great thing. to be on the show. I would say uh, if you take a moment to read the complaint, it's pretty clear, it's exhaustive, uh, and we have pretty clear evidence that there was an intent to evade U.S. law, in this case, the Commodity Exchange Act. Uh, and we took action. We took action quickly. It was important. Um, I've said for quite some time that this area um, has a fair amount of fraud, manipulation, and in this case, evasion of, of law, and I'm here to protect U.S. customers, and this is something that we needed to do to ensure that that ha is happening. Mm -hmm. Ross, when you look at uh, Binance and the, and the court documents, and what you're looking at is that this company was trying to get U.S. customers to use VPNs to try to access markets, obviously, in, outside the United States. Is that prevalent or pervasive within the crypto space? Meaning, is this how potentially you're going to go after other companies to wind some of this down? Yeah, I, I don't want to make any assumptions about what may or may not be happening, but certainly this is uh, a circumstance that we have heard about using virtual private networks, as you said, VPNs, to circumvent uh, sort of a, a barrier around U.S. customers. And that really is just an intentional evasion of U.S. law. You know, this is a global market. Crypto has proven to be over many years. Uh, and given the size and scope of some of these exchanges, it is a very difficult task to protect U.S. customers. But in this particular case, there's pretty clear evidence that there was an intent, um, an intentional strategy to evade U.S. law using these technologies and using these methods to get to U.S. customers, some large and some small as well. So. Um, it's a difficult task, but we're learning at the CFTC. We have great experts to do what we can with the resources we have to make sure that we're protecting U.S. customers and um, essentially policing these markets for this uh, evasion. So can you track Americans using VPNs like that? And, and we, this was part of the story, for instance, uh, in, in potentially banning TikTok, that a 15-year-old knows how to do more with a VPN than the lawmakers 
who are trying to write legislation around this? Or is that, the, is that still something that, that remains secretive? It's impossible to find where they're from. I, I wouldn't say it's secretive per se, but I will emphasize that we are a market regulator. You know, yeah. We are not experts necessarily in this space around Makes the technology in sense, but it's a difficult job. We use the resources we have as a civil enforcement agency to, you know, to, to work with other experts and to make sure that we're identifying areas where market participants are evading the law. Mm -hmm. Ross, you and Gary Gensler, the SEC chair, you disagree when it comes to actually what is a cryptocurrency. Uh, maybe you could set the record straight here for Joe and I. I is it a commodity? Is it a security? And if you are a company, how do you go about um, your future if you don't actually know where you lie within the regulation space? Well, I've, be I've been very clear about the commodity space, the digital asset commodity space. We've had listed futures, which are products the CFTC regulates, uh, on Bitcoin and Ether for a number of years. Bitcoin going back to 2017 and Ether just a few years later. And when we have listed contracts in our markets, derivatives, we as the agency, as the CFTC, have a natural regulatory tie and regulatory responsibility to police the underlying cash market. In this case, the trading of Bitcoin or Ether. So the fact of the matter is we've had Bitcoin and Ether futures, and we have a responsibility to police the underlying market. Because you can imagine if there's fraud or manipulation in the underlying market or what we call the cash market, that fraudulent activity or manipulation will have a direct impact on the markets that I regulate. And that's what I am directly mandated to, to police. So. Uh, this is a new area, novel concepts, trying to apply existing law. But I think, by and large, Chairman Gensler and I are in agreement on needing to root out fraud and manipulation and get bad actors out of the market. I don't want to make this personal with you and Gary Gensler. We'll say the SEC, for this case, has been accused of playing a game of whack-a-mole uh, when it comes to dealing with crypto enforcement. Is your agency considering... Uh, a comprehensive framework of regulations that might be more acceptable to the players in this business? Well, in our space, like I said, we have regulated derivatives, and we've had them for a number of years. It's certainly a lot easier to list derivative contracts on underlying commodities, even if we don't have direct authority under, over the underlying commodity. But I've made very clear for the better part of two or two and a half years that there is a gap in terms of existing law over commodity digital tokens. And that is something that I've been asking Congress for more authority so that we can police this market. Mm -hmm. Technology is disrupting financial markets. Technology is lowering barriers to access for retail market participants. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of speculative activity by retail investors. And as that continues to grow, a market area that we're not traditionally involved with, I think it's important that Congress act to give us that legal authority so that we can police these markets and protect investors. Ross, you oversee a lot of the swaps market. So before we let you go, can you give us some insight into what you were seeing with Credit Suisse and the concerns in terms of their swap market and counterparties? Yeah, you know, over the past few weeks, we've been very engaged. I myself have been very personally engaged with my colleagues across the U.S. government to ensure that markets remain stable and resilient during a lot of periods of uncertainty and high volatility. But um, as we examined our market participants, which certainly included Credit Suisse, uh, we did not see any activity or any reasons for high risk or um, leverage that couldn't be managed by the, the party or its counterparties. I think this is a product of the rules we have and the regulatory requirements, specifically around capital. Uh, and we felt comfortable and continue to monitor the situation because there's still a lot of uncertainty left mm. uh, and remaining in the banking space. But right now we're, we're relying on the law and the rule that we have uh, and, and feel comfortable that um, this is really a banking issue, but something that obviously could have an impact on derivatives markets. We're seeing the volatility in the space, but closely monitoring it and identifying any issues or anomalies and making sure that making others aware if we do see anything. All right, Ross, thank you so much for your time. Ross Benham, chairman for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Coming up, we're going to stick what's going on in the financial markets. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says bank deregulation might have gone too far, but Washington is divided. This is Balance of Power.
These events remind us of the urgent need to complete unfinished business, to finalize post-crisis reforms, consider whether deregulation may have gone too far, and repair the cracks in the regulatory perimeter that the recent shocks have revealed. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warning about the cost of deregulation at a conference today in Washington. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee was at that conference, and he joins us now. Mike, she's talking about deregulation potentially going too far. Then you have the Biden administration coming out and saying, we need more regulation. We don't need congressional approval for this. Was that what Secretary Yellen was talking about, or is she pointing the finger at lawmakers to go even further? I think a little bit of both. Not necessarily that she's expecting lawmakers to go further, but that the administration would like to spread the blame for what's happened with these banks. And they point to the 2018 changes in the banking laws that the Trump administration put through. Now, they're going to try to do what they can to... Uh, update the supervisory and regulatory regime that they use. They know there are holes in it. But uh, the interesting thing to me was another quote from her during her speech when she pointed beyond the banking system to the money markets. She said, if there is any place where the vulnerabilities of the system to runs and fire sales have been clear cut, it is money market funds. And so that might be a push for some sort of legislative fix. Remember, during the great financial crisis, and during the uh, latest pandemic crisis, the Fed established money market bailout funds, and they probably don't want to have to go through that again. What is then uh, the chance that we see a congressional uh, response here, Michael? There's been just no consensus on what to do, and we even heard, as I mentioned earlier, from Michael Barr this week, uh, saying that the changes in 2018 may not have actually been uh, to blame for SVB, that the Fed had the authority to act but did not. Yeah, it's going to be very hard to get something through, in part because it takes a long time to legislate and we get into an election year next year. But you're right. There's a lot of division about what should or could be done. Mm -hmm. Conservative Republicans don't want to bail out banks, and uh, they also don't want too much regulation of banks. Yeah. And Democrats, Elizabeth Warren, they're looking for even more. So I wouldn't put high Check odds back in on two that. Years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got you. Thanks for your reporting today. Fascinating uh, conversation that just continues to unfold here. Bloomberg's Michael McKee with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, Bermuda Premier and Minister of Finance E. David Burt joins us here in our studio in Washington to talk about his meeting with the Biden administration and crypto regulation. This is Balance of Power. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington, along with Anne-Marie Hordern in New York. And we have breaking news. Anne-Marie, the New York Times is now reporting that the grand jury in Manhattan that we've been talking about, this is the hush money case involving Stormy Daniels, has voted to indict former President Donald Trump. That news just breaking right now. We spoke with Lanny Davis, who, of course, is a legal uh, counsel on the other side of this case just a couple of days ago. Even he didn't know when we spoke with him, Anne Marie, a couple of days ago if this was going to happen. It's a major development here more than a week after Donald Trump said that he would be arrested. Yes, certainly. He will be the first former president, Joe, to face criminal charges. I'm just reading some through of this uh, New York Times reporting, and it says that this is obviously, as you mentioned, his role for paying hush money to a porn star, according mm -hmm. to four people. But the precise charges are not yet known. But, of course, mm -hmm. this is going to complicate the legal challenges around the former president. It's not just this indictment in New York, which we should note the Republicans are calling politically motivated. But remember, the former president is facing three other legal hurdles, one regarding the insurrection on the Capitol, the other regarding overturning uh, the 2020 uh, election results. This is uh, two at the federal courts and, and as well in Georgia. Uh, so this is just complicated. And remember, Joe, what Lanny said to us, that potentially this all starts to coalesce around the president at the same yep. exact time. That's right. The, the idea that these could all coincide, because, of course, we're waiting for the special counsel here in Washington investigating the classified documents case 
and the events of January 6th. Then there's Fulton County, Georgia, investigating uh, attempts, as they say, allegations that Donald Trump tried to overturn the election in that state back in 2020. So as we get into a campaign cycle here, yeah. to your point, Anne-Marie, the first time a former president and now presidential candidate for re-election has been under indictment, that could be times three at some point here. And boy, it sure impacts the conversation that he's going to be having with whomever else is on a debate station starting in a couple of months. Absolutely. And this is going to become incredibly more challenging for the Republican Party as they decide who is going to lead them. Because, Joe, what, has you, what have you and I been talking about the past week or two? It's that this indictment has only helped the former president when it comes to campaigns uh, financing, when it comes to making sure they can, he can bring in those dollars, also making sure his supporters and his base still support him. They say this is a witch hunt against him. Um, so this That's could potentially right. just help him as he goes into the race. But for the Republican Party, is this the individual they want to put up for 2024? Is this the moment where potentially they do start to back another individual? And maybe that another individual is Governor Ron DeSantis, although yet he has right. yet to say that he's jumping in the race. That's right. Uh, and of course, you know, the, we have a lot to learn here still. But remember, Donald Trump was fundraising on his initial message that he would be arrested, uh, what, almost two weeks ago now, a week and a half ago at this point. And I suspect that that fundraising will continue. This will galvanize uh, some of his supporters, most likely, uh, as the news makes its way. And we should note, Anne-Marie, the felony indictment, it's under seal. Again, Manhattan DA's office, it will likely be announced formally in the coming days. This is a report right now, and it's one that we've been waiting for here at Bloomberg. Yes, yeah, certainly is. Wall Street Journal's also just uh, also with their announcement following on the New York Times. Yep. As they say, they say the indictment is sealed for now. Um, but the exact charges against Trump are unknown. Um, but obviously, all of this points back to uh, that campaign, 2016, correct? <laughs> and the yeah, hush money right. and funds he paid to Stormy Daniels. Absolutely. Uh, and now Bloomberg is reporting this as well, which is an opportunity to bring in Wendy Benjaminson uh, from our political team here at Editor in Washington. Uh, Wendy, this is something that we have been waiting for, although we weren't too sure when it was going to come. Uh, it, it appears now this is actually happening, a former yeah. president under indictment. It's, it's an incredibly historic moment. Um, in, in American history, really. But it's also, it is just in. We don't know what the charges are yet, mm -hmm. as you said. Um, and, it, and we were very surprised because yesterday we heard the grand jury was taking a three-week break. Yeah, how about so that? we didn't know what happened, but I guess um, they came to a quick conclusion um, and decided to indict him. I don't think this will even slow him down from his his current run. He's going to run mm -hmm. as a victim of the Democratic deep state. And try to capitalize on And it. try to capitalize on that. Wendy, I'm not sure if you know this yet, so bear with me, but he's indicted. He's the first former president of the United States to be indicted. What does this look like? Where is he at the moment? Does he get his fingerprints? Will there be a mugshot? Is he going to be in handcuffs? Right. Well, as we understand, um, he is in Florida at his Mar-a-Lago home. He will, presumably, he got a courtesy call, or his attorneys got a courtesy call from Alvin Bragg's office. Then he will fly up, you know, he has his own plane, so he'll fly up to New York, um, where he will be fingerprinted, mugshot. There will not be the perp walk. The, as we understand it, the Secret Service was worried about safety and, you know, shutting down lower Manhattan for that and, and the, and the, you know, courtesy of that. He is a former president of the United States. Um, so he will be handcuffed and fingerprinted though and arraigned on whatever charges the grand jury, um, charge him on, but they are related to the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. They are indeed. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Donald Trump was hoping, right? He wanted the perp walk. He was reportedly he talking about what he should wear, whether there should be a tie, if he'd have handcuffs, whether he should smile, Wendy. That, yeah. He apparently will not have the opportunity to do any of this. He those. won't. He won't. It's just too hard to, to secure an area like Lower Manhattan. Yeah. You know, the courthouse is right in the middle well, of Well, particularly when he calls on people to protest and predicts Exactly the, right. And that's the next thing we're going to have to watch for, yeah. whether people protest. The online chatter we were monitoring showed that people after January 6th were not as eager to go into violent protest in, on behalf of Donald Trump anymore because so many of the January 6th protesters went to jail. Of course, Anne-Marie, we had barricades going up in front of not only the courthouse but also the U.S. Capitol uh, just uh, within hours of his predicting this would happen again some time ago, but those barricades are in place for a reason. 
Yeah, they certainly are. The former president has said that there would be. He wanted people to protest. He said there's going to be death and destruction. And then he went into a rally. And he made his problem, his indictment, also the issue of his supporters saying they are after me. So they are after all of us. And that's actually really, Joe, a change of his 2016 pitch to America, which was these are all the problems facing you. And now the former president wants to run again in 2024 and says these are the problems facing me and I need your help. Um, so this is going to make it much more complicated, though. But I still go back to that Economist YouGov poll we talked about yesterday. Most Americans do not think a presidential candidate should be paying hush money funds to a porn star overwhelmingly. But then when you put in the name Donald Trump, Joe, those those uh, that percentage certainly does drop. I'm keeping my eyes on Truth Social here. I don't see anything yet, Wendy. But to Anne Marie's point, this will only help to enhance the so-called retribution tour, right? Absolutely. And his poll numbers are only going up. Ever since this became <laughs> front page news again, his poll numbers have gone up. Yeah. 80% of Republicans in an NPR Marist poll the other day said they believe this is a witch hunt. 80% of Republicans. So at that point, this is only going to help him. At this point, though, Wendy, if, if the, the foreign president is indicted, right, uh, he has three other legal challenges against him, is this, is this just the point of no return for the Republican Party? Do they say we have to move on? Not if 80 percent of them believe he's being unfairly targeted. Um, and you remember, of course, that he also has... Uh, it's not only there is a special counsel investigating both January 6th and his handling of classified documents. That's a federal probe. Uh, the Georgia just Atlanta area district attorney is looking at his efforts to overturn the election. And then there's a number of civil suits against him for everything from E. Jean Carroll's accusation of rape to um, cooking the books at the Trump board. Um, and yet the requirement to be president of the United States is that you are 35 and an American citizen. That's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> We were talking polls. Uh, you mentioned, Anne-Marie, that, that YouGov poll. We talked yesterday as well about the Quinnipiac poll that showed Donald Trump uh, beating Ron DeSantis by a wide margin, 47 to 33. We got another one today, in fact, several more. One from Fox News has Donald Trump 54, DeSantis 24, a 30-point spread. I think we can argue, Wendy, thanks in part to this very story. Absolutely. And then there's another development that could happen. He's been indicted. This is a very creative legal case mm. developed by Manhattan the District Attorney case, Alvin Bragg. It. It's a zombie case. People keep trying to kill it. It keeps coming back. Now it's real. And picture the Republican reaction when Donald Trump, if Donald Trump, is acquitted of these charges or the charges are dropped. It's, a, it's not a terrifically strong case they have. But just wait for the rest, right? Wait for the rest. Joe, I want to bring in a statement we're getting from Crew, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Of course, mm -hmm. everyone is going to be coming out with some sort of statement, but this is from the President Noah uh, Bookbinder, and he says Donald Trump was the most corrupt president in American history. He was the first president to be impeached twice. Now he's the first former president to be criminally indicted. And then it goes on to say uh, the charges in New York are the first ever brought against him, but they will not be the last. I imagine the next 24 hours, there is going to be highly, highly partisan, politicized statements that will be coming out. We actually uh, we got one just now. Maxine Waters tweets. Now, this is, Wendy, this is going to be the, the Democratic message here. So, she writes, Trump finally got indicted! Exclamation point. I predicted he would, and I predicted Stormy Daniels would get him. Sometimes justice works! Exclamation point. <laughs> Is that kind of celebrating by Democrats going to help the cause for Joe Biden? No. No, it's not. I mean, within the own, within the Democrats' own circle, I'm sure there will be champagne corks popping tonight and mm. all those sort of stuff. But that's remember... That's a dangerous party. That's, <laughs> yes. They have... They have tried to impeach him twice. Twice he's been acquitted, even in the shadow of the destruction of the Capitol on January 6th. Mm. He's been acquitted twice. I think they need to be very, very careful. One thing, if you're, if you're just tuning in, we should recap what we are learning, because this is quite unprecedented. Well, it is unprecedented, and it's historic. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, all reporting the Manhattan District Attorney 
has not announced the charge has not announced the charges but has indicted the former president of the United States and obviously a uh, campaign candidate he wants to be the 2024 mm -hmm. candidate right Joe for the Republican Party um, you do yeah. wonder though if the Republican Party Joe is able to move on from Trump if this just all becomes too messy for them to make sure he's a candidate but to Wendy's point he could be in jail. Look at Eugene Debs, ran on the Socialist Party from jail, actually. But if this all becomes too much, remember, in that latest poll, Biden is only able to win if the Republican candidate is Trump. When it switches to Governor DeSantis, you actually see Biden polling against him. So potentially, this is something that can hurt the Democrats in the long term. Well, and you do wonder what the statement will be from Ron DeSantis. He's been pretty successful at threading the needle here to try to please both sides. As we heard him remind everyone that Donald Trump, as he said, paid off a porn star. Yet he also admonished the Manhattan DA for bringing this case. As Wendy was saying, a lot of folks just don't think it has the strength to carry an indictment. But here we are indeed with the first former president to be indicted. And we'll be learning more about the charges as we go. We want to add another voice to this conversation here in Washington. Joining us is Jody Schneider, political news director for Bloomberg TV and radio. And we've been talking about this for some time, Jody. It's actually happening now. What must be going through the mind of the Florida governor today? Yeah, that's right. And any other candidates uh, mm -hmm. who are who are potentially running against Donald Trump, the conventional wisdom has been the more of those candidates that are on the stage, the better it is for Donald Trump. But now, if you have an indicted and charged and in big legal trouble, yeah. Donald Trump does that weaken that. And then what is the conventional wisdom for Joe Biden? That's right. Yeah, exactly. What happens to Joe Biden if, does he come out, Jody? How does the White House play this moment? Um, they obviously want to look like they're not getting involved. I think uh, President Biden has really tried to deflect when he's asked questions about this and just let Trump be Trump out in the public. Um, but at some point, they're going to have to say something. Well, that's right, Emory. And and what they say, they will be measured against very much, right? If you come out and you look like you're gloating, uh, you look like you caused this, uh, then, you know, that will add to backlash. Uh, but if you don't say anything, if you act like this is just a normal moment, then that doesn't look particularly good either. So I think um, everybody involved has, you know, you, these are going to be very carefully crafted statements, you can imagine. But it will, you know, the fact that uh, Joe Biden hasn't announced yet uh, is also kind of uh, interesting here. Um, and there's been all kinds of debate about why he's waiting and all that. But now one wonders if he waits even further. Uh, you wouldn't want to necessarily announce around this. So, again, another reason to hold off on the announcement. Every time we think this might happen, you know, then again, Joe Biden's in no rush. Does this stay in the briefing room at the White House? You know reporters are going to be asking about this. They're going to have to craft some sort of response for tomorrow. Absolutely. This is the huge, I mean, this is historic, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's really, everybody's going to be watching how that's played. I'm sure it will be, uh, it will be in the briefing room tomorrow. We I also be very surprised if it wasn't. We also had a story out earlier today about the former president, Donald Trump's super PAC, putting serious money behind his amped up rhetoric against Ron DeSantis. The former president certainly sees Governor DeSantis as his biggest challenge to getting to that 2024. But now it looks like his biggest challenge is going to be fighting these multiple. One is an indictment. The other three are still lingering. Well, oh, that's right. And also, remember, uh, you know, as we've been discussing, this may just be the first of these. Uh, we had actually expected, perhaps, to see the outcome in the Georgia case uh, or one of the other cases before this, but we, we didn't. Uh, so those are still out there. And if there becomes a, you know, multitude, uh, you know, this really uh, is not the only indictment or not the only charges, uh, that is certainly a different ballgame. You know, Wendy, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump said in Waco... Uh, last week, and I think, or it might have been in his interview on Fox after they, they all start to sort of blend together, that this is a new form of election interference. Democrats can't beat me at the polls, so they're going to try to do this now and, and ruin my reputation with a crazy zombie case about a porn star. Uh, to what extent is that true? Well, it's a variation on a theme, right? Ever since he was first elected, there was the Russia investigation, yeah. which he said they didn't want me to win, so they're trying to take me out this way. And then there was the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine case that didn't seem to, that didn't get anywhere. Then January 6th, that didn't get anywhere. So he sees this all as a progression of them ramping it up. 
look, these are prose career prosecutors. They believe sure. they have a case, and they'll, it should be tried in the courts. I do think the White House will probably be very, very careful not to spike a football, not to sound the notes that Maxine Waters sounded, and to, um, you know, let lawyers let the lawyers and the courts and the judicial system yeah, right. because that's the other thing we have to worry about our institutions we don't want to seem like a country that takes out former presidents um, or future presidents uh, when when they can as we republicans want... hold hearings on weaponizing the absolutely. federal government absolutely absolutely and that Especially fulfills the, the, Justice the narrative that he's trying to make exactly yeah. right uh, we're joined by wendy benjaminson by jody schneider here uh, with breaking news from washington the first ever indictment of a former president. Of course, as you see, that's Donald Trump. Images of him in Waco uh, just last weekend. And we're joined at the table now as well by Bloomberg government's Jack Fitzpatrick, our voice from the halls of Congress. Thank you for coming in here, Jack. Uh, the response from congressional leaders is going to be important in this case. And I'm thinking of first in line there, Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Uh, what's his next move? Uh, you know, the initial response from a lot of members are a let's let this play out kind of response. You're going to see some very careful responses. Uh, you are right to ask about Speaker McCarthy. We haven't gotten a response from him yet. Yeah. It, it is a tough position for uh, Republican leadership in Congress to be in uh, with the, the danger of alienating Trump politically if you push too hard. Uh, you, you saw a little bit of uh, pushback on even Ron DeSantis's comment about the, the context of this saying, I don't know about the process of paying off a, a porn star. Right. Uh, if you come across as taking shots at Trump, uh, it, it seems to be perceived as a, a dangerous decision for any mainstream congressional Republican leader to make. So it's a tough position for, uh, for someone like Kevin McCarthy. Jack, we also need to remember, of course, you have Republicans in Congress wanting to subpoena Alvin Bragg. Where does that stand? Uh, that it, we're going to have to see what the latest is on that, and and hear from uh, members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, it, it, it's a it, we're clearly in a, a situation that's very much in flux. Uh, this does put a spotlight on uh, sort of the the political pressure uh, and the response from congressional Republicans on Bragg. Uh, the, it, you know, a lot of members have have. Um, Again, essentially said, let's play this out. Let's let this play out. Uh, but there is certainly, uh, I, I think, additional scrutiny on anyone involved in making this decision uh, that led to this indictment. We spoke this week uh, with Michael Cohen's attorney, who I mentioned a moment ago, Lanny Davis, on the allegations against Trump. Here's what he said. The insurrection and the denial of the election results. I wonder whether the desperation was wanting to retain the presidency to protect himself from the wrongdoing that he's now being investigated for. You know, there have been so many questions, Jody Schneider, about the, the, the strength of the case here. Lanny Davis, who represented, of course, former President Bill Clinton during his own scandal, says if, if this was the case back then, we had signed checks, this would have been a slam dunk. Michael Cohen went to jail for this already. What does that portend for Donald Trump? Well, some people are saying this is the strongest of the cases to make, hmm. even though it may be the least con sort of consequential yeah. in terms of it's not obstruction of justice, it didn't have to do with January 6th, but that you have signed checks. Mm -hmm. And it may be a fairly open and shut case, according to you know, legal experts we've spoken to. So, And, of course, that plays into the politics. Well, you're just going after this one because you can make this case. Yeah, huh. But... You know, this raises all the questions. And, and one thing we haven't talked about is fundraising. Mm -hmm. Because remember, mm -hmm. Donald Trump, when he said uh, you know, he was going to be indicted a week ago Tuesday, yeah, he made a lot of money. Um, there were a lot of fundraising appeals off of that. And there have been, for Republicans and Democrats, sort of saying, you know, the various messages around this. So I, I bet we, we may have fundraising appeals uh, in our inboxes yeah, already. Yeah, let me check that email while you're talking. <laughs> right. Hang on. Absolutely. Do you remember in the summer when the FBI was going to be raiding his Mar-a-Lago estate, he was fundraising on this, and I believe he was making around $180,000. That's how much the former president was able to bring in, and soon that went to a million dollars a day. 
And this is how he was able to really get the excitement, I would say, of his base. Uh, so this is incredibly important. I also just want to bring a little bit of color of what we're hearing uh, of, via Twitter on the Capitol. Um, you have Representative Ralph Norman, of course, Republican. This isn't about justice or the rule of law. It's about the optics of an indictment. That's all they care about, total witch hunt. And then you have Representative Eric uh, Swalwell. The indictment of a former president is a somber day for America. Uh, you know, Joe, I think this is an important moment that, that we should just t take a breath. The former president of the United States is indicted. Mm -hmm. and, and to this congressman's point, it is a somber day for America. How does this reflect of how the U.S. is represented on the world stage? Well, that's a great question. And it's obviously there's nothing good uh, there as people watch from abroad. But you know, you just pointed out two relatively extreme lawmakers, right? We've heard from Eric Swalwell and yeah. Maxine Waters on the Democratic side, Ralph Norman on the Republican, Republican side. Everyone's fulfilling their roles here uh, as partisans that will likely continue. I I'm curious to hear from some of the centrists uh, who, who are working on Capitol Hill. And to that end, Jack Fitzpatrick, uh, will we hear from them? Because, you know, once you start talking about this, you put yourself out there uh, and, and, and create some attraction for an attack from Donald Trump. It is probably a tougher position for, you know, you, you raise centrists, for someone who's a Democrat representing what you'd call a, a Trump district. Right. Uh, and that's not even necessarily that many centrists, but people with really tough districts. Mm -hmm. uh, someone like Joe Manchin might be in a, a bit more of a tough position. Mm -hmm. Really, you look at the most mainstream Democrats, you're probably going to see, uh, so it, 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 you even mentioned the, the fundraising on this, yeah. seeing an opportunity to connect this, even though this isn't an indictment on uh, the 2020 election issues or any of the bigger Democratic issues, there are a number of, um, of Democrats in the mainstream, even closer to, you know, your moderate range, who are very willing to go after Trump. It's a bit tougher maybe for a Joe Manchin, a, a John mm -hmm. Tester, uh, to watch exa exactly how they phrase their response to this. And Marie, we just uh, brought Kristen Hahn to the table, partner at Rock Solutions, Democratic analyst. Kristen, thank you for being here. I don't know if you're celebrating or if you're worried about what's going to happen next, but one of the first questions we asked is how Democrats, and specifically this administration, play this. I mean, I think it's really it's interesting because Trump has been like Teflon. So before, <laughs> anybody before Trump, I'd be like, oh, this is the death knell. I mean, there, yeah. there's no way. But with him, he saw it coming. You could tell he saw it coming because he tried to get out in front of it and he lied and mm -hmm. said, you know, this is going to happen when he didn't necessarily know if it was. But he seems to be, you know, capitalizing on it. You know, he, he fundraised, sent fundraising emails about it. So I think you've got to think carefully about, you know, he's still the front runner in the Republican, uh, amongst the field of Republicans for president. So, you know, I think it's, it's you know, it, we'll, we'll see what happens. Obviously, Democrats will have to condemn him. You know, I mean, this is something that somebody else actually went to, already went to jail for. Um, mm -hmm. But how the Republicans play it out, I'm really interested in seeing the line that they're going to have to walk. You know, we're, look, barricades are up in front of the courthouse where Anne Marie is. If we start to see real protests, what does that do to polling numbers, the perception of this case? I mean, I think that, you know, his supporters, I mean, you have to look at polling numbers across the board. Mm -hmm. I think the people who are with him are going to be with him, mm -hmm. and that's not going to change. Um, you know, there were a lot of, January 6th did not, you know, that wasn't something that was really compelling, unfortunately, to a lot of, a lot of Republican, um, Republican voters. I think that being reminded of that day. Got it. All right, our thanks to Kristen Hahn, partner at Rock Solutions, and to Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick, Jody Schneider, Wendy Benjaminson. Uh, what a day. This is historic and unprecedented, Joe, isn't it? You said it. History unfolding before our eyes on Balance of Power. For Anne-Marie Hordur and I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg.